We're good. Okay, go ahead, Frank. Uh, good morning, everybody. The Environmental Health Registration Board meeting is convened at 9.03 a.m. on October the 1st, 2021 at the Health Licensing Office in Salem, Oregon, or by teleconference call. Um, I will now call roll. Frank Brown here. Rhonda Robb. Scott Kruger. Present. Thank you. Bonnie Simpson. Here. Thank you, Bonnie. Jonathan Schott. Here. Good, thanks. So it looks like we have quorum. Is that, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Um, correct. Members, when you wish to speak, please state your last name for the record. For the record, public members calling in to the public phone line are asked to email April Fleming at april.fleming, that's F-L-E-M-I-N-G, at D-H-S-O-H-A dot state dot O-R dot U-S and provide your first and last name. Public interested parties feedback may be heard during the public interested parties feedback period indicated on the agenda. Everyone is asked to use appropriate language, manners, and protocols when conducting board mis business. The meeting is called to order. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> um, the first item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Would you entertain a motion from someone, um, John? Yeah, this is John Schott. I'd make a motion to approve. Is there a second? This is Scott Kruger. I second that. Great. Everybody in favor? Aye. You have to, you have to go through the roll call because oh. remember, everything's got to be verbal. You're so tough on me every time. All right. Um, hang on. I got to find your names again, which is not like totally hard to do. But all right. Frank Brown, yes. Scott Kruger. Yes. Bonnie Simpson. Yes. Jonathan Schott. Yes. OK, so motion passes to accept the agenda um, as submitted. OK, what else we got? April approve <laughs> April approval of 2022 meeting dates. You can tell it's still a little early over here in my brain. <laughs> um, OK. So let's see, what, what do we have as far as dates listed here for 2022? So this is Sylvie. We picked out March 4th and September 30th. So I would entertain a motion. Do we need to do that? To yes. accept the two meeting dates scheduled for 2022 as submitted here um, in the agenda packet. This is Bonnie Simpson. I submitted motion to approve the dates as submitted. Great, thank you. Second, please. This is Scott Kruger, I'll second that. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so we're gonna have to do a vote for everybody. So um, Frank Brown, yes. Um, <laughs> Scott Kruger. Yes. Bonnie Simpson. Yes. And Jonathan Schott. Yes. Great, thanks. So motion passes to accept the 2022 meeting schedule as submitted. Again, make a note on your calendar. That's 9 a.m. March 4th and 9 a.m. September 30th. Um, I'm sure the Health Licensing Office will send us out the warning on those two. So <laughs> don't plan vacation. OK, all right. Um, <laughs> 2022 chair and vice chair. OK, so this is Sylvie. So currently we have Frank obviously serving as chair and Rhonda serving as vice chair. So here's our dilemma. For one, you have to vote for 20 every year. You have to vote for chair and vice chair. However, Frank has graciously retired and also is on his second full term and terms out in February. So he can continue to serve until replaced if we need him to and he's willing to. However, he cannot serve as the chair because his term will be done. So second dilemma is that Rhonda is currently vice chair and normally boards elect the vice chair to move up to chair. However, Rhonda obviously is not in this meeting. <laughs> and so not 100% sure if she wants to be chair. So you guys have to have a discussion figure out what you want to do, but you do have to elect a chair and a vice chair for next year. 
So this is Frank Brown. Um, I just was curious if anybody is interested in that role and wants to kind of nominate themselves or nominate each other or anything like that. This is your chance to get out to somebody, right? Say, oh, I'm nominating him. Um, no. So if anybody you know is interested, though, um, would be willing, I think, to go with that route. Chair position, anyone? Y'all all are qualified. All of you are quite capable. Mostly this being the chair is just entertaining reading script as far as I'm aware. <clears throat> I'm a little John. apprehensive on that, but I wouldn't mind, you know, being nominated to be the vice chair if Rhonda wants to move up, but I guess she's not here right now to speak for herself. So um, is there any way anybody can reach out to Rhonda by email or get her? She's on, she's on vacation. Okay. Well, I think that this is John shot it um, kind of sarcastically. If somebody doesn't show up, then that means we can volunteer them, right? You can. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the other thing and correct me if I'm wrong, just for clarity, my term has also expired, correct? Correct. Yeah. You're serving it's until replaced. Right. Um, the other thing, just to let you all know, I don't know if it affects my ability to serve or not. Um, I currently live in part time in Boise and part time in Oregon. My tax filing for my permanent um, my permanent home changed uh, mid year from Baker to Boise. Um, I don't know if how that impacts my ability to serve. Um, let me hold. I'm going to get grab my book. So. Um, this is Frank Brown real quick while we're, we're thinking about this, but Bonnie, are you interested in any of the roles? Because I, I mean, I know we could nominate Rhonda, but if she's not here, we could also take on the responsibility ourselves and, you know, go from there as well. So I don't want to usurp her necessarily, but I also would like to make sure that we have someone in the role. Right. So with COVID, I've been working in CD for the past two years. I'm not even doing environmental health that much. I'm still licensed, but right. So I'm not right. sure. <laughs> okay. It feels kind of weird saying, "Yeah, I do that," when I'm not actually doing the work anymore. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bonnie. Well, this is this is Scott Kruger. I suppose that leaves me. <laughs> so I, this is Frank Brown. There's a couple of options I think we could put on the table. We could go ahead and nominate Rhonda as chair in her absence and Scott as vice chair in the absence, or we could ask Scott to go ahead and be chair and then, you know, either Rhonda or um, Bonnie could do the other role. Um, but I'm thinking, well, how do people feel about the first one just to kind of float the balloon? Would folks feel comfortable with that? Yeah, this is Scott Kruger. I'm I'm not uncomfortable with that. The time commitment we have to be in the meeting anyways, and based on my experience, it's basically reading script to keep the me meeting moving forward. So I'm 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 okay if it goes that direction. This is John. I think the only concern would be, you know, from the state's point of view, if it would be really important to be certain as to who the chair was. Um, just with the uncertainty, um, maybe having Scott in a chair position, uh, just to have that. Um, firmly in place. If that's uh, if that's something we need to consider, I would feel completely comfortable with the either in that chair position. This is Bonnie. I just because she's not here, I think I'd be more comfortable having Scott be in the chair position, and then I'd be willing to do vice chair. And that I think would be the equitable way to do it. This is Scott Kruger. I agree. So at this point, since we've had some conversation about this, why don't would somebody put a motion on? Can we do that? Just put a motion on the table for that slate of yeah. Scott and Bonnie and go from there and then we'll vote. You, you totally can. This is John. I'd make a motion for Scott as chair and Bonnie as vice chair. Second, please. I know you guys are the, on the roster. I, can I second it? No. Nope. Oh, darn it. <laughs> I will second. This is Scott Kruger. I will second my nomination. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. All right. Um, so I got to do roll call on the voting again. So um, uh, going through the roll, Frank Brown, yes. Um, Scott Kruger, yes. 
and Bonnie Simpson. Yes. And Johnson Shy. Yes. Great. All right. So motion carries for the next um, officers for the um, registration board. Yay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. I really, we really appreciate you stepping up and helping everything out. So, okay. Okay. So I want to go back to what John was asking about earlier about his um, location. Um, so the statute says that you just have to be licensed to practice medicine or surgery by the Oregon Medical Board. So as long as you maintain your Oregon license, it doesn't talk about your residence. Then I'm good. Perfect. Okay. That's great. All right, so let's move on. So we're on the agenda under director's report. Um, just a couple little things. Um, we kind of already talked about one of them is the need for board members. So. We obviously recruit as much as we can, but um, if you guys don't mind, you know, in encouraging others to apply to be on the board, um, there's going to be a new process on how people apply. It's the going away from the paper is going into that workday, which I'm assuming you all got those um, workday emails about taking um, training courses. So they're not implementing that until uh, some this month, I think, is when they're starting it. So it's a new change in process. But regardless, um, obviously, we need a replacement for Jonathan. He's continuing to serve until replaced, but that's a physician. But that's also a physician who s focuses in, in environmental health or public health kind of. And so if you know of anybody who might be interested, that'd be fabulous. Um, we also need a public member. We need some more environmental health specialists. And then I am working on, for those of you who've been on the board for a while, working on trying to figure out how to get the, there's one board position that is very specific to somebody who works in the food and beverage industry. And we have not been able to fill that position for as long as I've been in the office. And that's been since 2009. So I need to figure out somehow to convince the governor's office to change change that title of that position to be less restrictive. We have tried everything as in literally sending somebody out physically to go to people to try and convince them to get on the board. And we have never been able to fill that position. So that's something I'm working on kind of behind the scenes. Who knows if it'll ever happen or not. It's a statutory change, so it has to go through the legislative process. But we've always had an issue with that position. So, and then when we start having quorum issues, makes it even worse because you can never fill the position and now you're getting quorum issues. And so it's this double edged sword. So, just letting you know, I'm working on that. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about is with the last legislative session, we got genetic counselors. So, genetic counselors is a new program that's come into the office. Um, we're already started the process, they will actually officially start licensure in January. Um, which means in July of next year, our internal cost allocation will get redistributed again because we have now up to 17 boards and programs versus 16. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to your financials. But um, any questions on that? No. Okay. So, Sorry, this is John. Yeah. So genetic counselors will will report up through this board. No, they'll report through the office. So, at the office, okay. you guys are one of currently 16 boards and programs right. and then come January you'll be one of 17 <laughs> so they're right. one of the other 17. Thanks. Yeah and they're a very very specific group there's uh, we're guesstimating about 60 of them in Oregon so it's not like it's a huge group of individuals. And then the next thing I wanted to talk about is COVID-19 as it relates to us. Obviously, COVID, I don't want to talk about the big picture of COVID-19, um, but the office is still closed um, to the public. We are open by appointment and appointment only. We originally had the governor um, had us opening up September 1 with a new Delta variant. Obviously, that got put on hold. So now her um, scheduled opening date, um, which would be where you don't have to have an appointment, you can just walk in. Is January, well, she says January 1, but nobody's open on the 1st. Um, so January 2nd, we would um, then have our doors open. So we're working towards that goal now. We'll obviously see how things go. Um, 
There are several things internal that the office has done to try to um, expedite certain types of licenses. Um, one of the licensing groups that we were licensed are respiratory therapists who are obviously some of the hands-on frontline number one person dealing with um, COVID patients. And the state has also needed to have, so we put in some rules that allowed for individuals from out of state to come in and, and it, almost immediately have a license because you can't practice without license. So all there's a bunch of stuff in place. Um, we also changed rules regarding continuing education, being able to be done online versus in person for anything that used to be done in person. Those will stay in place until the emergency is done. Uh, most likely, not 100%, but most likely the late fee, because um, currently it's waived down to a dollar now for anybody who is renewing during the pandemic. Um, once we open back up, which would be January 2nd, that discount for the late fee might go away. So there's a lot of things that the office did for the COVID-19 that are kind of in this weird transition of, do we continue doing it? Do we not need it? Do we need it? And so do, is it tied to opening back up? Is it not? You know, so working on all that stuff. Um, after, even after we open back up, meetings will be held just like this. So we will continue doing MS teams. We will continue to try and reduce the amount of uh, people in the office when possible. Plus, this allows you to um, communicate and don't do board meetings without having to travel, especially if you have to travel long distance and your meeting is just a regulatory meeting, very short and is only like 30 minutes and you travel an hour and a half. I mean, yeah. So we're going to continue with MS Teams. We're also going to even even if we do have people in the office for a board meeting, we're still going to use MS Teams because we're going to start transitioning to where MS Teams does the recording and that will have our record of our meeting. So MS Teams is not going away. So this looking at each other on the computer stuff is going to stay. <laughs> so any questions on any of that? This or anything Scott, to do with COVID? Yeah. This is Scott Kruger. I have a question. Sure. I'm going to say within the last year with renewals with environmental health specialists, um, there seemed to be a lot of back and forth about uh, receiving notifications in the mail versus people that didn't receive notifications in the mail. And my, if my memory serves me, um, <clears throat> your department said it's not our responsibility to make notification. You know that you need to be renewed every year and it's your responsibility to go online and, 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 and meet your renewal date. But um, <clears throat> for me personally, I've never had an issue. I've always gotten my packet in the mail with my special code. It's never been an issue. So my question for you is, is, is that being addressed? Because it seems like some people are, are getting <clears throat> getting notifications while others aren't. And I'm, I'm not sure I understand what the gap is because I've never had an issue with it. Yeah, I'm not sure what the issue is either. Um, we do send out, so they're considered a courtesy. So it's a courtesy renewal. You have to renew whether you get it or not, obviously. Um, one of the things that we are doing in the office is working on, so any of you who have worked with the state for very long know that nothing in the state moves very fast. <laughs> one of the things that we're working on is getting a newer version of our database. And that newer version of our database will allow for a lot of electronic forms back and forth, including electronic applications versus a snail mail piece of paper application. Um, and it will also hopefully do a lot quicker of the um, being able to email renewals versus snail mail renewals. Um, again, it will hold the, the applicant accountable for making sure that we have their email address and their email address is correct. Um, but ho And so hopefully that will start eliminating some of that. And I don't know if the, I don't know exactly what the issues are. I mean, we'd have to know of like a specific person to be able to know a specific issue. But we try to send out the renewals 45 days. Sometimes it's a little bit less. Um, within the renewal time frame. So if you were to renew in October, we would have sent you um, a renewal notice roughly around September 15th. That's what we try to do. This is Scott Kruger again. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious um, if you do <clears throat> move to a an electronic format, then am I understanding correctly that the license would be remitted in a in a in a branded PDF that we could print out on our own and that would be considered valid? 
That we, I don't think so because, so if you ever try to make a photocopy of your license, you're going to see that it's it's printed on an extremely special paper. So when right. you make a photocopy, it says void, 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 void. So it really prevents somebody from taking your license per se. And so the printing of the licenses most likely will continue being through us and be mailed to you. However, you can obviously go on to the website and see that you're renewed and that you're current. And that's more of the, you know, the piece of paper thing. And got to remember, again, 17 boards and programs, we have to think bigger picture, not just environmental health specialists. So, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Okay. So let's get into the licensing and statistics stuff. So if you guys have your board stuff, I am on slide 13. So this just shows licenses issued um, broken out um, by quarter for fiscal years. Again, our fiscal years are weird, but it sh says it on there. So remember, our year always starts in July 1 and ends on June 30th. Um, but this again just shows licenses issued, broken out by quarter. Next slide shows renewals. And this is the online versus paper. Because wow. we try to encourage everybody to do online. Obviously, you can't do online if you're late. That prevents that. But um, Renewing online is a lot more streamlined, a lot less paperwork, a lot less expensive for the office to to do. So that's why we give you this information, just just because. <laughs> um, the next slide shows wastewater specialists, the renewals, both paper and online. So you're, I think there's, we'll get to one of these slides. There's not very many wastewater specialists. You already know that. And as of right now, I don't think we have any trainees. For wastewater. Um, next slide shows licenses for environmental health specialists broken out by age or and gender. You do not have to give your gender, which is why there's another. Um, and then, but you do have to get us, give us your date of birth so that we we know how old you are. But that's what this slide shows. And as of when this was ran, there was 289 environmental specialists. Sylvie, let me interrupt. This is Frank, if you don't mind, but just not at all. And I know, but I'm hoping that you can speak to Cleese about this at some point, just because, you know, it continues to show that a large proportion of our environmental health specialists are over the age of 40, you know, and it looks like we have some good generally diversity as far as, you know, female to male ratio and some, you know, improving, which is nice to see. Um, but I think that age thing and the reality that we're going <laughs> to, you know, we're going to lose folks. And I think that the supervisors um, and other maybe administrative folks might benefit from that. Even if, I don't know, maybe we could talk about even just sending some things to them and saying, hey, you know, look at this. Think about what it might mean. So just a thought. Oh, absolutely. And I've spoken, um, I'm trying to remember, it was a couple of years ago. It was, I think it was more of an association meeting versus a CLE or CLO. Yeah. And yep. I, um, I have zero issues speaking at any kind of, you know, so if anytime they want to put me on the agenda for like, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, just to kind of go over this kind of stuff that they said, you know, I, we would really like to know, um, you know, age, gender statistics. Um, we also have the ethnic breakdown if they would want that. Um, we could also break down, um, we cannot break down where they work but we can break down where they reside, where their residence is. So anytime they want any of that information, I, ha I have zero issues doing it like a little quick demo for them and an answering some questions. So here's your next slide. So I'm on slide 17. So this is the wastewater specialist. You can see there's a, there's a total of nine individuals in Oregon. Um, and then again, broken out by age and gender. So very 34 and older and no trainees. So they're obviously very, <clears throat> very wastewater specialists are very 
Um, you guys can do wastewater, but they can't do, you know, so it's very specialized. But there's only nine in the whole state of Oregon, so. This is Scott Kruger. Yeah. Um, are those are those wastewater specialists generally folks that would be assigned to large municipalities? Um, Honestly, I don't know. I know that <clears throat> DEQ has some exemptions, but not. I think the DEQ's exemptions come to environmental health specialists, not to wastewater specialists. So they could work for environmental health. Scott, you're on mute. Um, they could work for environmental health. I would think it would be the other way around where they'd be more rural because they're doing on-site wastewater. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, and also make this is Frank speaking, Frank Brown. Please make sure you remember to say who you are and that thing because we can't always tell, even though, anyhow, thank you. Yeah, because this is Sylvie. We don't, uh oh. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm like, Frank Sorry. just disappeared for yeah. a second. <laughs> I'm going to stand up, so I don't want you to see me running around my pajamas. So. <laughs> Um, we don't keep track of where people work, so, um, we don't have the information of, of where they actually work. So if they're environmental health, or I mean, if they're, um, uh, work for DEQ or not. So, or if they work for a county, we don't have that information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide. I'm on slide 18. Just this shows the licensing trend for... The top one is a, the environmental health specialist and then the trainees. The bottom one is for wastewater specialist and trainees. So broken out, um, this is an average per quarter. So it shows on average, you guys have about, I would say on average about 35 um, trainees for environmental health at any given time. Um, like I said earlier, we don't have any wastewater specialists. I um, mean, you and wastewater specialists, there's been nine in Oregon for years. Um, any questions on that? No. All right. Next slide. So we are on the financial slide. So this is for, um, let's remember again, our years are weird. So it shows 2018, 19, 20, 21, and currently 22, which is where we currently are. Um, so 2018, your beginning cash balance was the 97, then your revenues, expenditures, and then your ending cash balance of 127, which then gets brought up to the top of 2019. So it just keeps rolling forward and keeping you guys in separate. Um, you can see your revenue going across. And then your expenditures going across. And 2019, it looks like it was a lot of revenue and a lot of expenses. So not 100% sure that that's accurate because that just looks way out of whack. But I can double check on that. Um, because 123,000 in 2019, I bet you, you know what, I bet, I bet you they're double counting. Okay, so <clears throat> when we were independent versus when we were in the health authority, so they moved money out of one account and into one account, so I bet you they doubled up on <clears throat> and counted both our old account and our new account and our old account and our new account. I bet you that's what it is. Because those two numbers, both the revenue and expenses for 2019, is they're way higher than normal. So I will um, double check on that. And Anne, do you mind sending an email to Nathan and oh, I don't think Tracy does our stuff anymore. No, she Nathan. doesn't. I'll, I'll have Nathan look into it. All right, perfect. Scott, you have your hand up. Go ahead. I don't. I don't know what's happening. Scott does not have his hand up, but I do have a question. Oh. No, he has his little, like, his little MS Teams hand. John, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at John so, and saying, Scott, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> is it correct? So the, the money coming in is predominantly coming in from licensing fees and that kind of thing. And then expenditures are predominantly things like investigations and that kind of thing. What's, can you go through the ins and outs a little bit? Thank sure. you. Sure. Sure. So all revenues are brought in by fees. So whether it's an application fee, um, original license fee, an exam fee, not that we, well, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but 
Um, we do the wastewater exam, so we administer that. <clears throat> it doesn't get taken, obviously, very often. Um, and then, obviously, any renewals, any um, civil penalties, any, you know, anything. But all of that fee, it, fees that any environmental health specialist pays goes into that fund, and it stays in that fund. And then the expenditures are broken out into different categories. So you have your direct costs, which is anything related directly to this board that's very specific to you. So that would be um, the per diem that we pay the board members for board business, any travel that the board members do, which is none right now, um, any investigation that, or um, like where the attorney is working on an investigation that's very specific to you, that gets billed to you. So our DOJ bill gets broken out by all the different boards, depending on what she's working on. <clears throat> then your indirect costs are things that um, basically aren't directly tied to you. So for instance, my wages is prime example. Rent is another one. Um, it gets divvied up based on a percentage to all 16 boards and programs. And then in July of next year, it'll be between 17. And so that's based on, on the number of licensees you have. And um, there's also a couple other little, like internal allocations that talk about um, the exams. So there's three staff members that are in the exam pool and exams get divvied out by only by boards who have exams and then how many exams we administer on average in a year. And then inspections, um, you guys, we don't do inspections for you guys. Inspections, we have five inspectors and those inspectors are all divvied out between boards that do have inspections. And then investigators are work for all boards, and so they're divvied out like same way that I am. Does that make sense? So there's a whole lot of behind the scenes, a little bit of percentages of all this little stuff. So thank you. And yeah. Hi, this is Brown. Did Scott have a question too? Thank you, Frank. Yeah, this is Scott Kruger. I, I, that's that's a fairly large ending cash balance. Yes. Um, what happens to that money? Does it just sit there to support the work that you do for our board and just keeps rolling over year to year? Yes, it does. So it your money does not go to anybody. Uh, it Like we don't like pull money out of your fund and put it towards anything else. So one of the things that the office is working on right now is the Board of Cosmetology and Respiratory Therapy and Polysonography, those two boards, um, their fees need to be increased because they're operating in the negative. They're not bringing in enough revenue to support them. But those fees have to go through a process. Like I said earlier, state government works really slowly. So those fees will increase in January. So January 1, those th their fees will increase. Not everybody's, just those two specific boards. So try and get them up and out of the negative. Once that goes into place, then we can start maybe offering discounts to individuals to renew online, which again, to encourage more people to renew online. Um, we don't change fees without having to go through, they, this is why things go, happen so slowly. So if we wanna change a fee, it has we have to do forms and a whole bunch of paperwork and it has to go to the governor's office. The governor's office then has to approve it and then it has to go before the legislation and it has to be ratified by the legislators. So that's the reason for a long, very long process. Um, and you don't want to do that whole process to reduce fees. What it's better to do is to put some sort of rule in place that offers a discount. So the fee is still the same, it stays the same, but then you get a discount for doing something. So you get a discount for renewing online or we waive the fee, for, not that you guys have a lot of exams, but we waive the fee for when you take exam for a retake. Not the original exam, but like if you have to take a certain portion of it again, you know. So those are the different kind of things. We'll start working on that next year. So, um, and if you make sure that we have it on the agenda for our, was it, what day did you guys pick out? March. Um, March 4th. March 4th. At the March 4th meeting, um, we'll have a discussion. Most likely what we'll do is start figuring out what the, dis um, the discount can be for renewing online. Because by then those new fees will be in place. Um, our, the goal is to have a decent cash balance, but to not have it continue to grow. You want to have a good enough cash balance so that if you have a case that has to go to a hearing and it get, that gets very expensive very quickly. And we can only recoup the cost of that up to $5,000. So 
that's why you want to have a little bit of cushion. Um, you guys are not a litigious group. We're not, you know, normally taking away people's licenses and issuing them citations, but you get one unusual, strange case, and it will suck that money up in about two seconds. So, so yes, we want to have a good cash balance there, but as you can see, it's continuing to grow, and that's what we don't want. Yeah, this is Scott Kruger. I'd just like to kind of just quickly repeat what I think I heard as far as a yeah. March 4th agenda is that at some point you are reviewing for the Environmental Health Registration Board alternatives to provide discounts for doing particular activities. Was that correct? Correct. And usually the, okay. the, the easiest one to do is encouraging. So I'm, I don't even have your fees in front of me at the moment. So say you get a $10 discount if you renew online. So everybody who renews online would pay $10 less than people who do it through the snail mail, which is an encouragement to, you know, obviously you can't renew online once you're late. So that kind of, you know, right. but yes. And it, whether it's $5, $10, $20, that's what we need to do the analyzing of to see, you know, on average, here's how many people who renew online. So if we continue that way and we give a $10 discount, how much, you know, savings is that going to be, you know, because the, the, what that will do is it'll bring your revenues down. Your expenses aren't going to change because, you know, we're still doing the same thing day to day like we normally do. So it just brings your revenue down, which then will, won't continue adding to your balance. Right. Make sense? Yes. And this is Anne. Something else yeah. um, hopefully we'll figure out by the March 4th meeting if these financial numbers are skewed some way. So you'll have a more accurate picture of the money that you do have in your accounts. Yeah, well, I know that the numbers, the the beginning and ending cash balance are not what, those are correct. What mm -hmm. I think is incorrect is the revenues and expenditures for 2019 are double yeah. counted. Yeah. Because I know that she checks the, because the, the ending cash balance, that comes from a different report and you have to balance to it. There's no getting around it. Okay, so, cool. Yeah. Any other questions on the financials before we move on? All righty. Next on the agenda is the regulatory report. And you'll notice, for those of you who can see, and Bonnie, you can't see, that Bob is not here, not on. Um, however, Trampus is here in his replacement. Um, Trampus, if you want to take over, we are on slide number 21 of your materials. All right. <clears throat> so this is Trampus, like Sylvie said. Uh, Trampus, Chuck, uh, I'm kind of filling in for Bob. I'm just going to kind of go over the report. I, you know, the report is pretty straightforward. Um, uh, you know, it shows three biennium on it, uh, the 2017, 2019, 2021. Um, the 2017 biennium, actually everything is closed. We had three come in and three have been closed. Uh, the 2019 biennium, uh, there is still one open case on that one. Um, but uh, of the four that came in, one of them is still still kind of hanging on. And then um, the 2021 biennium, we had five come in and um, two are still open. However, I think one is one of the ones that you'll be reviewing today uh, in executive session. Um, and I believe the other one is actually probably closable at this point as well. But um, so you can kind of see that. Uh, and, in, and over on uh, in the next little area, there are complaints by type. Uh, you can kind of get an idea of what um, what is coming in uh, in a kind of a general sense. Uh, there are three categories on on this uh, report: uh, licensing concerns, um, which seem to t be the most uh, prevalent type of complaint for you guys. Nine of the twelve are licensing concerns. Uh, safety and sanitation issue um, was one. And then um, services provided, there were there were two uh, in the 2019 biennium. But like I said, um, I'm not sure what the details are on, are on those at the at the moment. But um, that's the kind of broad categories. I could kind of explain what those different categories are if people had questions. And then uh, the other little box is just telling you where, uh, how they came in. You know, uh, were they anonymous? Were they from a client, or were they from some other source? And you can see that most of them are from some other source. But um, 
So yeah, did anybody have any questions about this before? This is Scott Kruger. I just on the 2021 line under cases by license type and open and closed status. Mm -hmm. And you look down the 2021 line and you did mention that one unlicensed environmental health specialist. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My thought process is that, that should always be zero. And what can we as a board do to support that process for um, environmental health managers? Because in my mind, uh, you know, licensing expectations is very clear. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly we have some people who are engaging in that work that don't understand that process or that line would be zero. So right. what can we do as a board to help support getting information out to all managers across the state who are potentially hiring trainees to make sure that they're properly credentialed before they begin work? Well, um, I can tell you that that unlicensed category can kind of be a big umbrella. Um, it can it can be anything from somebody who's um, working with an inactive license, sometimes is, is categorized as, as unlicensed. Um, usually not though, usually that's more of a licensing concern and it's put under an environmental health specialist. Um, they also can be um, unfounded. They can be somebody just thinks somebody is working unlicensed and they're, you know, they're, they're, um, they, it turns out that they're not performing the duties that would have uh, put them in the situation where they're working unlicensed. Um, it could be anything from a school to a county health department to, you know, just an independent person. So, um, you know, as far as as reaching out, um, you know, I don't know. That's probably not in, in regulatory's purview. That might be something more that um, uh, policy or or somebody else would uh, maybe can speak to a little bit better about options for um, sending out uh, education, kind of to in a general sense to put out there for people but yeah that unlicensed category can be a very broad category and you there would be a lot of um people that that uh could fall into a complaint or get a complaint against them possibly for uh, unlicensed practice so thank you for clarifying yeah this is brown um i know that i think we've read or gone over some things in the past where somebody used the title environmental health specialist you know, and so that was a complaint that came in. It really was kind of broad. And then you all um, regulatory kind of checked in to see like what they were really doing and advised them to maybe not use that title, you know, in the, in their working. And I'm hoping just as an addendum to this uh, that, you know, like I just, <laughs> You know how it's nice when you're on these remote calls, but I text the chair of the <laughs> Conference of Local Environmental Health Supervisors while we're here just to say, hey, reach out to Sylvie, because that's another good way to just have a conversation with either the Environmental Health Association or the Environmental Health Supervisors group about, this is licensing, don't forget, this is licensing, make sure your people, you know, check with the health licensing office, you know, they have the answers, you know, that kind of thing. So um, that will help, I think, Scott, with some of your uh, concerns uh, as far as kind of making sure folks get that information. We'll hopefully get that in a system that will allow for that kind of conversation to happen. So thank you. Thank you. OK, this is Sylvie. Any other questions for Trampas? All right, let's move on to policy. So we are going to talk about some rules. We're on page 24 of your materials. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier about the, you know, extremely um, high growing, fast paced environment or wastewater specialist. Um, one of the things that we do every um, we're required to do by statute is to re-review rules on a regular basis. Every five years, they're supposed, we're supposed to review. So Anne did her review, and we've had a little few discussions in internal um, about how a couple rules weren't quite aligning with reality or with what's in statute. So she Anne pulled out just these two rules, very specific. These two rules. We didn't, you know, the, all the other rules were fine. We didn't need to open all the rules, but we did need to open these two. So the first one is about the retake for the wastewater exam. Um, and the reason that we didn't even really pay attention to this, because, you know, we administer the wastewater exam like hardly ever. Um, but this rule, the way it was written, which is all the, the 
strike through, everything line through, doesn't match up with what your statute says. So what the law says and what the rule says, they didn't match. So what Ann did here is just make this rule align with the law, the statute. And so that's what the changes are. So you can see there the bold is the new verbiage. The strike through is what, it, is what the old verbiage is that's going to be deleted. Does anybody have any questions on that one? This is Brown, um, just real quick. So, but folks still know, because this looks like it's really about the wastewater specialist. I don't know why necessarily environmental health specialist was in this. So I think this is a good chop because it looks like the title at the top of this is, yeah. you know, in wastewater specialists. Um, but do folks right. know then, th folks know they have so many retakes and that kind of thing that's spelled out in either this or some other process, I'm assuming. Sure, you're talking about for environmental health? No, I'm talking about because it takes out the um, a wastewater specialist applicant has up to two attempts to pass the exam. So is that spelled out someplace <laughs> else? The number, the new number one. So the new number one says an applicant for a wastewater specialist registration who fails to pass an examination on the second attempt. Yes. That's what aligns with okay. the statute. Yep, my yes. bad. I yep, can't. The old, the old rule didn't align with the statute. That's good. Okay, I just want to make sure that because I think that's you know that it's important, but it's right there. So good job, yeah. Anne. Sorry, yeah. my bad. Okay. <laughs> All right. The next one down, which is on that same piece of paper, is talking about continuing education. So one of the things that it um, talked, or this is about the audit. And so when we do an audit, uh, so we, just a refresher, this one is a, aligns with what reality is. So as a refresher, um, individuals attest to their continuing education. And then we do an audit and we pull 10% of them and say, hey, you got selected, here's your letter, you need to give us all this information. And so um, the office is already determined the 10%. And so all we're doing here is deleting the determined by the board because that, that it just doesn't allow a lot align with how reality is. It doesn't mean it, we have, it's not changing anything. We do the 10%. We've done the 10%. We've always done the 10% and it's just fixing this rule. Any questions on that one? Cause all it's taken out is, is determined by the board that those four words, it doesn't uh, change anything. Right. This, just, this is Brown. I think you guys have a standard operating procedure of what would allow for a good, uh, valid audit yes. of folks. Yeah. And I think this is a great change. Yeah, it's just cleaning it up to match with reality. It's, it's, it's doesn't actually affect and change anything other than this rule. All right, so next slide is the schedule. So here's where well, you still have to make a couple of decisions, but here's where um, our plan is, is to get those two fixed. And obviously we have to go through the whole process um, and get them fixed. A nice good cutoff is obviously January 1. Um, and even if per se, a wastewater specialist was to apply and take the exam, we would still abide by the what the law says because you the rules never supersede the law. The law always supersedes the rule. So even if prior to January 1, we had a wastewater specialist who attempted to take the exam and didn't pass for the second time, we would still do what the law says, not what this rule currently says to this day. So just, just so you know. But a nice, good, clean way of getting rules into effect is to start January 1. So Anne has this schedule here. So obviously, um, um, you guys are meeting. And then, so, so Anne needs to do the whole process. So obviously today, you guys are meeting. She's gonna file once we, you guys vote and all that stuff on the 4th. Um, then the proposed rules will appear in the Oregon Bulletin. This is part of the process. And then public comment period will close on the 29th. Obviously people have a right to comment on the, any kind of times there's a rule change. So somewhere between November 29th and January 1, we need you guys to meet and um, vote on permanent rules. Um, so we need to have a special board meeting. So we have a calendar and we're ready, but we need you guys to figure out a date that works for you, works for us. And the only thing on the agenda will be approval of the agenda, talk about any public comment that we received, 
go through the rules one last time, vote on permanent rules, and then the meeting will adjourn. It will not have anything other than that. So it won't take long. So, Anne, do we have a suggested date that we can see if that might start working for them? Um, well, you know, December is a month that we generally leave wide open um, because we don't like to have a lot of meetings. Folks are on vacation and um, but if you prefer Fridays, we have December 3rd, December 10th, December 17th. Um, if you don't necessarily need that day, my goodness, um, we have. Let's, two yeah, let's look at let, let's look at December third. Does let's okay. let's talk about this. Um, Frank, do you have any issues with December third? Like a nine a.m. I like I like I said, it should be very quick. We'll be done by okay. ten. Yeah. Yeah, the th third looks good, and I think earlier in the month, the better that we have it done. And or if there's something strange that happens, we can pop it off onto the tenth or something. That's a great point. Okay. All right, so Frank, you're good with that. John, what do you think? So I was just looking at my calendar. I'm actually going to be out on the third, so I wouldn't be able to make the third. I could make the the uh, the tenth or the seventeenth. <clears throat> we don't tenth have to do a Friday either. Yeah, so we could do the second. What about the second? I'm going to be out that week. I'll be out that week. Oh. Let's go to the 10th then, OK? I okay. mean, I think that would be my suggestion at this point. Okay. And I'm good with that, so you don't have to ask me. Ha. Huh? <laughs> so Scott, you can do the 10th, right? I mean, John? Yes. And yes. Scott, too. Scott, you can do the 10th? Yes, I can. Awesome. What Bonnie, Bonnie, what do you think? I can do the 10th. Yay. So we'll do the 10th at 9 AM. All right. It'll, it, and like I said, it won't be long because we won't have anything on the agenda other than obviously you have to approve the agenda, but then work, working on the rules. OK, this is Kruger. Could, could yeah. you uh, how quickly will you send out a meeting invite? Because I'm at the time of the year where my schedule five minutes from now will be full. And so um, <laughs> the sooner we get that identified on my calendar, the better. I can have April send out today. She's actually probably at her computer working on right at the moment. Um, okay. She can send you guys a hold for your um, calendar invite. So she'll send you an email for the four of you for that date. And um, then she'll also, she also will send it um, to Rhonda and, and get it on her calendar too. Yes. And this is Anne. Since this is a special meeting, um, I'm pretty confident I can have the agenda written up today and included with that calendar and that way you have something official yeah and then we can get it on everybody's calendar yeah okay. thank you okay perfect we'll get that we'll get, so you'll get it today i have yes. a quick question oh. Sophie. am i on the board then just till february and then i kind of hang out as long well, as all right so you in as long as you're willing to you will stay in your position and be serving into a place similar to the way Jonathan is because Jonathan's term was up quite some time ago. Um, <laughs> but unless you officially resign and say, I am not doing this anymore. One of the things that you do have to remember is that if you want to continue to serve until we're replaced, you have to keep your license current. And I know you're not working. So if that's one thing that you're debating, you know, because you obviously in order to renew, you have to do your continuing education. So there's one thing that you want to keep in mind. So. Yeah, CEUs wasn't tough because NEHA was all online this year. It was pretty straightforward right. to help facilitate a lot of it. So that's not the big deal. But yeah, I just was curious about yeah. um, where I am as far as, you know, acti active per se. On yeah, so you would stay active. So you're actually in that position until you formally by writing. So you have to like email Paige or me or whomever and saying I'm resigning as of such and such date or the governor's office has to appoint a replacement for you. And so those are the two things that have to occur. Otherwise you're on the board until, well, you get disqualified if you don't have your license doesn't say current. So three, there's three ways to get off the board. <laughs> okay. So I have a quick question again. Do we need yep. to approve your yep. A proposed regulation uh, rule that you submitted, Dan, and thank you again, Annie. <laughs> nice job 
with the write up and clarifying all this stuff, it was really um, very clear. So, I mean, if, do you want me to jump onto that or just? Uh... You can. So, I'm on page 28. So, okay. if you are looking at the materials, um, slide 28 will help with that motion, either Scott, John, or Bonnie. Thank we you. make a motion to approve a special session for rural review on December the 10th of 2021. And Second. and the rulemaking schedule. And, and the proposed rules. And yeah, the proposed so rules. With the rulemaking schedule. With the rulemaking schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. This is John. I'll second what he said. Great. Great. Let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Frank Brown. Yes. Scott Kruger. Yes. Bonnie Simpson. Yes. Jonathan Schott. Yes. OK, motion passes. Thank you all. Thank you. OK, so let's get into the executive session. And can you find out first before we go in there, is there anybody on the phone line? OK, hang on one second. Um, this is Ann Thompson at the Health Licensing Office. Is there any member of the public on the phone? No. Okay. So, because we do have a public interested parties feedback period on the agenda later. So, I just want to let them know an estimate, if there was anybody on the phone, an mm -hmm. estimate of how long you were going to be in executive session. So, since there's nobody, there's kind of no point in talking about it. So Frank, you should have a script that talks about entering executive session. Yes, I do. Hi, this is Frank Brown. The Environmental Health Registration Board will now meet an executive session pursuant to ORS 192.6602F and ORS 676.595 for the purpose of considering information exempt from public disclosure at 10 a.m on October 1st, 2021. Representatives of the news media shall be allowed to attend the executive session by conference call and will be provided further call and in instructions shortly. The public phone line will be muted for the duration of the executive session. Um, are there any representatives of the news media on the public phone line? No, there is not. Recognizing that there is no news media in attendance, the public phone line will be muted for the duration of the executive session. We will return to open session before taking any final action or making any final decisions. We are okay. now in executive session. Great. Let's let me do the switch over. Okay. Hang on. Sorry. Please. 